All right, let's go ahead and everyone grab a seat. Thank you so much. Wonderful. If you have your Bibles, open up to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We are going to be closing out our series on guarding the gospel today from 2 Timothy. And uh, we've looked at uh, first and Second Timothy, and the importance that the Apostle Paul has placed on uh, Timothy and the responsibility that he has as a young pastor, but not only as a young pastor, but uh, as, a, um, as a Christian to be able to keep the gospel at the forefront of everything that he is teaching, uh, every aspect of the way he lives. And so even today, we're going to read uh, about Timothy and Paul's final words to him. Uh, there's probably, uh, Paul is in prison while he's writing 2 Timothy. Um, and there's probably about a, I think it was like a three to five year gap between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy of Paul's writing to him. And he's just encouraging, reminding uh, Timothy of the work that he has to do in um, Ephesus there. But uh, Paul continues with this pastoral theme when he's writing to Titus as well, who is a, a, another uh, child in the faith that, that Paul has. And so Paul leaves Titus in Crete and he leaves Timothy in Ephesus and and he encourages both these young men to continue to be faithful in preaching the word of God and guarding the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it really is a testament and a letter to you and me as well, that we also have this responsibility. This isn't a responsibility just for pastors, but this is a responsibility for every Christian that you also Guard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You need to make sure that you're sharing the gospel correctly and that you're defending the gospel when someone tries to add to it and that you are standing firm in the gospel because really it is the thing that is most important to us. And so we say, well, Phil, what is the gospel? Well, simply the gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means. It's good news about Jesus Christ. It's good news about his, his life or his birth, and which we'll start next week a series on the birth of Jesus Christ and what it means for us today. But it's about his birth, it's about his life, it's about his death, it's about his resurrection and his ascension. Those five elements of Jesus' life make up the gospel. That is the good news. The good news is, is that Jesus Christ, God in heaven, came to earth, lived a sinless life, died a horrific death, was raised from the death, and ascended to the right hand of the Father. That is the message that transforms dead hearts. That's the message that transforms marriages. That's the mes message that transforms everything. The gospel is good news. And that's the message we must proclaim to a lost and dying world. Everything else is peripheral. Everything else is, is uh, important, but it is not of the main importance. The main thing is the gospel. This is what Paul is defending. This is what Paul is encouraging Timothy and Titus both to make sure that they guard the gospel and don't allow these other teachers to come in and begin to add to the gospel because the gospel doesn't need it adding to. Jesus has come. He's died. We've been justified through faith in him and him alone, not by faith in Jesus and by some good works that we do or some good thing. It's faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, period. Amen? Amen? And that's what we get to celebrate every day of our lives, knowing that, knowing that there's nothing we can bring, there's nothing we can bring to the table. All we bring 
is our own filthy righteousness, the Bible says, and that is insufficient. And so what we get to do is just accept Christ by faith, and by accepting him by faith, we now have incredible access. We now have incredible access to the Father through prayer because of Jesus Christ, and now we, we are a new creation in Christ, kind of like what Ray was saying today when he came up and read from Genesis. We, we've got, our names are the same, but our identity is totally different. We're not the same people. We are now Christians. We are now in Christ. Everything that we do is because of Christ. Any good that I do is a direct result of what Jesus has done in me. Anything that I do, it doesn't matter what I do. Everything. When I go to Columbia, it's because of what Christ has done in me. When I write a book, it's because of what Christ has done in me. It's not me. It's Christ in me doing all of these things. When I, when I preach on Sunday mornings, it's not about me. It's about making sure, making sure I'm being faithful to the text and exalting and pointing everyone, you, to Jesus Christ, to make sure that you see that hope is not in a man, but hope is in a, only one man who is also God, and that's Jesus Christ. That's the goal of what we have to do even as Christians when we share our faith. We've got to point people back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So with that said, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1. He says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering at the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretan has gone to Galatia, Titus to Domitia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful for me in the ministry. Tychus, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left at Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, but the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he has strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for what it means for us today to be your children and to look and to listen to your word. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and open up the ears of our hearts today that we may be able to hear this word from these passages and may apply it to our lives to be challenged and convicted in ways that only you can so that we draw closer to you and rely more upon you for our strength and our grace and everything that we do. And so, Father, we thank you for it and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 
My focus point today, it's in your notes or on the screen, is simply this. Be faithful to God because God has been faithful to us. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy here to encourage him with this idea of preaching the word of God. He reminds Timothy of his calling. He reminds him of all of these things. But really, it is for us as well. Some of you, quote, may not preach, but it is the sharing of God's word. And that's really my focus point. My first point today was let's be faithful in sharing God's word. As Christians, what is the main thing that you love to share about? What are the things that you do? I mean, we could come in and we can talk about the Gator football game yesterday. I mean, what a great game. They're not supposed to win. The last two weeks, I, I, I mean, in Columbia, I was keeping up with the scores. Couldn't believe my eyes two weeks ago. Even surprised yesterday. And you can talk about those things very naturally. Is the gospel the same way that you can talk to individuals as well, just like you would any sport or anything that you like to do, to share about and be amazed by? Are you amazed at the word of God? And just talk about what the, the word of God means to you. But it's being faithful to share the word of God. So if we were to look at it for us today, us, us as Christians in our no this is Paul's charge to you and to me. I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who is judges the living and the dead, and by his appearing, share the word. There, there it is, share the word. Preach it, share it, be ready in season and out of season. You don't know when God's gonna bring somebody your way and drop them into your lap to, uh, you know, to hear this element to where you may not be in the right mood. You may not be in the right frame of mind to be able to share the gospel. You may feel like your life is in shambles. And how can I share when, my, when I feel like my life is like this and everything just seems to be going wrong? How can I share this? Well, that's the encouragement that we have today. That's the encouragement that we can build from one another. It says that that's the perfect place for you to be sharing because your weakness and in your weakness, Christ comes and he uses you in your weakest times. There are just times where I, I'm, I'm just amazed at how God brings people in my way to where I can be myopic, thinking about me and my issues and my problems, when all of a sudden God just brings somebody my way that it, A, it just opens the door for me to just share with them a little bit about what Christ has done and how it takes my eyes off of me and onto what Christ is doing and it just changes my entire situation and my circumstances because I'm open at that moment, listening to him, waiting for him, and I know that in season and out of season, I've got to be ready to go. I've got to be ready because God can use me at any time to share his word, to preach his word, to do whatever it is. It is God who comes and he's going to judge, it says, that Jesus is going to judge the living and the dead at his appearing. We talked about this idea of judgment uh, when we did a series a couple months back on death, judgment, hell, and heaven, a four-week series that we did on each one. And we talked about the judgment and that we're all going to stand before Christ one day and we're going to be judged for everything that we've said and everything that we've done. And these are the things. But Paul is writing to Timothy, reminding him of all these things that are going to happen, but to charge him as well to preach the word and to be re in, ready in season and out of season. And I love this idea because when we share, you know, Tim, uh, Paul is telling Timothy to preach the word. And so what is that word that he's supposed to preach? That word is the gospel. Everything that Paul talks about, it's the gospel. So preaching the word. And so you and I, it's the same for us. We are to preach the word. And why is it important for us to preach the word? Because the preaching of the word is what sets people free. It's not, you know, it's not the latest thing on, you know, preaching about a bad self-image or preaching about problems that you're having. Those are symptoms, but the, 
the remedy for all of those symptoms of a bad self-image, a bad marriage, a bad relationship, uh, addictions, all this stuff, the remedy for all of that is the word. That's the remedy. That's why we've got to preach it. That's why we've got to share it. Look at the different metaphors in your notes or on your screen. I want to show you some different metaphors that the Bible describes the word of how God says what the word is. First of all, the first metaphor is is fire. The word of God is like a fire. Look what it says in Jeremiah 5.14. He says this, behold, I will make my words in your mouth fire. And this people would, and it shall devour them. Jeremiah 23, 29 says this, is not my word like a fire? So when we preach the word, when we share the gospel, when we do these things, it is the very thing that is what people need to hear. All these other things on the peripheral you can deal with on the outside. But the first problem that we've got to deal with is the heart and to see that the word of God and give them the word of God and it's like fire to them is one metaphor. It's also like a hammer is another metaphor. Jeremiah 23, 29 says, is not my word like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? Yes, it is. It's like that hammer that comes and just smashes the rock. Another metaphor is the word sword. You're very familiar with Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's what the word of God is. Ephesians 6.12, he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and use that thing to be able to see that the word of God is powerful. It's a sword. It's fire. It's hammer. It's, It's a sword. It is used to bring about change. And in some cases, it's used to bring about destruction. It's to destroy that person, what they think their life is, it's to break up their hard hearts, it's to do all of these things. That's why it's important for us to make sure that we are preaching the word, that we're sharing the word, that that's the main thing that we share with individuals when we go out. And then Paul encourages them to be ready in season and out of season. And I've already talked about that. Be ready at any time to share the word of God. And then he says to use the word, this word, use it to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. There are times where we're going to use the word in different ways. There are times we're going to use the word to rebuke individuals. And we, I think we use these times to rebuke individuals when the person is a Christian. And they're walking by the wayside. And we'll get into that a little bit more here when we look at relationships that Paul has. There's a time where we need to be rebuked. I know for in my life, there's times where as I was in a, uh, with Kay and I were married and having relationships in my life where there's been numerous times where, where brothers in the Lord have rebuked me in a loving way. And they've used the word of God to do that. And I, I, I was changed by that and grateful for that. So there's times where we're going to need to use the word of God to rebuke. There's times where we're going to need it to reprove somebody, to reprove that individual. It just means that you're, you're stating a case, like in your, a lawyer, it's a legal term here of what you're doing. You're using that to reprove them, to win them over, to win that argument To get them to change, the rebuking side really comes in with the serious, strenuous approach to when somebody's doing something that it's it's just sin. It's a wrongful deed, a wrongful act, and you're doing that. You're rebuking them. And then to exhort, man, use the word of God to encourage the brothers and sisters. Encourage them with patience. Encourage them with teaching. Use this For us today, it's not just preachers that are to apply this into our life. It's us today as everyday Christians. Use this. Be ready to go and to use this. And why do we preach the word? Right here in verses 3 and 4. Look at at what Paul says in verses 3 and 4. For the time is coming 
when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You see, people are going to reject hearing the word, the word of God. Some people don't like it. It doesn't fit their mode or whatever the case may be, but that's why we've got to be Keep this thing central. They, they want something more. It's just like at different times, you know, they say, you know, why are you so gospel preaching all the time? I'm like, well, that's a great question. And I do it because this is the Bible gives us the gospel. Yeah, but shouldn't you move on to other things? I said, yeah, I, I can preach on other things, but I'm always going to go back to the gospel. That's where the gospel is the center of everything. Jesus is the center of everything. And I'm going to point you to him. And the way that you're going to overcome all these other areas, if you've got anger issues in your heart, if you've got pride in your life, if you've got issues in relationships, if you've got uh, addictions that you're addicted to, all these things are great. I can give you scriptures, but I'm going to give you scriptures. But guess what? All these scriptures are going to point back to one person. And that's Jesus. And are you in love with him more today than you were yesterday? Are you looking to Jesus to be the one, as Galatians 2.20 says, that comes in the life that you're now living in the flesh. You're living by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. Have you crucified yourself with Christ? Are you doing these things? Because if you will do these things of Galatians 2.20, then guess what? Everything else about your life is going to change. You will not get angry towards your wife or towards your children. You will be able to have self-control in your life because self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Anger is not a fruit of the Spirit. Pride is not a fruit of the Spirit. These are fruits of the flesh. And the way we overcome the fruits of the flesh is by meditating and cultivating the fruits of the spirit in our life. And we've got to continue to do that. And when we do that, we see that it is fruits of the spirit, which Jesus has given us to dwell inside of us, which is the gospel message. And because what is the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to convict the world of sin and he's going to point everybody to Jesus. That's what the role of the Holy Spirit. He is the comforter to remind us that Jesus is in us to give us that power and strength to overcome sin so that we can walk in godly lives and we can be lights for him. But yeah, there's going to be people out there when you preach it, they don't want to hear it. They want their ears tickled. They want to itchy ears. They're going to accumulate for themselves. One of the amazing things that I've known about Colombia and when I'm there, I love being involved with the churches in Colombia because they are gospel-centered churches. Man, they, they preach the gospel. But they face the same thing that we face here in the States. The most popular uh, doctrine that people go to is the health and wealth message, the prosperity message in Colombia. Those are the largest churches in Colombia. And you, you just think, how can that be when you're pretty much a third world country? How can you go to a prosperity message when you just see it all around you every day? But that's the message. People want to get their ears tickled. They want to, there's something more. I, I, I look at life and I, I need more. Oh, this is my ticket? You mean I'm not going to get sick? You mean I'm going to be prosperous if I continually give you my money? And, and so you see that's happening. That's the challenge that the pastors are facing in Colombia today. But the good news is, is that over time, people see the truth and they hear the gospel message and they're hungry for what has taken place. It's the same thing here. People will go and they're going to find out there's got to be something deeper than just Jesus dying on the cross. No, there's nothing, anything deep, deeper than that. You see, that's the amazing thing about the gospel. The amazing thing about the gospel is this, is that even a child can understand it, but yet it confuses even the most intellectual person. I, I dig into this word all the time, and I'm amazed and realize that of 40 years of being in ministry, I've only scratched the surface on the word of God. 
I'm still being taught new and learning new things over and over and and the depth and the riches of it. Folks, we can mine the word of God for the rest of our lives and we would never be able to comprehend all the truth that's there. But yet it's simple enough that even your six-year-old son or daughter can understand it, that Jesus came to die for them because they're sinners. It's a great message. It's a message for all of us. It's what does it, but people will reject it. Second thing I want to look at is faithful in ministry. Let's be faithful in ministry. In other words, let's be faithful with our Christian life. Toddy read this today. When Paul's encouraging Timothy, he says, But as for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And I would encourage you to, that this is for you as well. Hey, guys, be sober-minded. Don't, don't, don't be double-minded, be sober-minded. Double-minded is be, you're being tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine that comes. You're not sure about this. One minute, you know, you think God loves you, the next minute you don't. Then you go back and forth. No, no, no. So let's stand upon the truth of the word of God. Let's be sober-minded in our thinking. Let's endure suffering. We're going to suffer, so let's endure it. Let's do the work of an evangelist. Let's go out and share the gospel with others. Let's, let's do this. this is what it is. Let's fulfill our ministry. What is it that God's called you to? Let's fulfill our ministry as well. And then Paul says this, and if there ever has been a passage that I feel like now I'm getting older, I, I feel like, okay, I, I related to this. As I started reading this, I, I just started laughing. I just said, I'm getting at this stage now where Before I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. So in other words, Paul is at the end of his life. He understands that he's probably going to die very soon here. And so he's aware of that. I don't think I'm going to die yet, but I can see that light at the end of the tunnel there. But when I went into ministry, this verse and this last part has always been my prayer. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That, that's just been a prayer of mine because I'm aware of this. I'm aware that unfortunately there, there are men that teach the word of God that don't finish the race. And, th- and that scares me. Scares me in a reverential all way, scares. Not that I'm afraid that I'm going to do something, but 40 years of ministry. I was in Colombia, and the brothers asked me, they said, hey, Phil, did you hear about this person? I said, no. And they began to share with me, and I know this person, have a couple of his books in my office, And just heartbreaking. 67 years old, faithful brother, teaches the word of God on a national level. Comes out, he's now 72. Comes out and he's had a five-year relationship with a girl that started, she was 20 years old. And now she's 25. He's 72. The relationship started at 67. Broke my heart. They have removed him from pastoral ministry, which is good. They've stopped selling his books. And I can go on and on and name to you other men and women who have thrown away years of faithful ministry. And as a pastor, I, I walk... And I have tried to surround myself with men who will challenge me to make sure that they're asking me the questions that need to be asked. Because this is very real for me. This is when Kay and I were first starting out in ministry. Uh, Many of you may know this, but when we started out in ministry, uh, four of the five pastors that I had in my life, all of them failed except one. And my other brother that 
took me in. He's a faithful minister of the Lord, but as a child growing up, these were the four of the five. And the last one was when I, Kay and I went away and um, just had a time with the Lord. And I, I just said, Lord, I, I don't want to go in ministry. I, I don't want to be a pastor. If all I'm going to do is sleep around on my wife, defame your name, then take me home. I, 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 I'll just get a secular job. Don't want it. Because this passage here, I have prayed, Lord, help me to fight the good fight. Help me not just to run the race, but help me to finish the race. And help me, help me to finish the race, Lord, uh, with busting through the tape to where it's like, I can run more. I, I can run more. I want to run more. I, I don't want to come across limping to the finish line. I want to come across busting through the gate, busting through the tape and saying, Lord, keep me going. Keep me going, Lord, because I, I, I don't want this. And so by his grace, by, and it's all his grace, it's not me, but by his grace, he has been faithful to me. He has kept me kept me right and pure and I have an incredible wife who loves me amazingly and I have an incredible wife who I love dearly but I I look at and I just say Lord I want to finish the race I want to be like the apostle Paul and says I have kept the faith I have been faithful I want to hear the words well done good and faithful servant that's what I want to hear I want to hear those words. I want to hear them well. And then when I hear those words, I know I'm going to weep because I'm going to say, Lord, I've done everything. I've wanted to make sure I am doing everything in my can. I understand temptation. I can't even imagine doing some of the things that these men do. It just comes up and it, it just overwhelms me. And I want you to know that by the grace of God, By the grace of God, I have been faithful to you for 27 years here at this church. I have not put myself in compromising positions. And I will not. There's too much at stake. And it's not just for Timothy. It's not just for me as a pastor. It's for you as well. Don't put yourself in compromising positions. Fight the good fight. Run the race, finish strong, because there's a world out there that's watching you, and you may not think that they are, but they are. And then when we are not faithful, when we are not true, when we are not keeping Christ at the center of our life in every aspect, I, I, look, I'm not saying we gotta have perfect marriages and perfect families, and we gotta live a perfect life. I'm just saying let's, live, uh, let's have faithful marriages, let's have faithful families, and let's have a faithful life. Just be faithful. Don't be perfect. When you blow it, repent. Believe me, there's a lot of people that blow it, and it's okay. But you can have faith and you can know that God can take, when, when, the, when a relationship has been broken, God can restore that relationship and make it even stronger. That's what happens when we break a bone, right? When we break a bone in our body and they place it back, it comes back, it comes back stronger. It's the same way in relationships. When a relationship, you feel like you and your spouse, you got a broken relationship. Well, the good news is, is that God can come and heal that relationship and make that thing stronger. That's the hope that we have. He can make it better. He can even make it. But let's let's fight the good fight. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your family. Run the race with your family. Run the race with your wife. Keep the faith. Keep it. And when you do that, Paul says this, then henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but all those who love his appearing. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus as we run this race. And man, I tell you, there's nothing, nothing better that we can do through this. So the encouragement to us is let's be faithful in ministry. Let's be faithful with our lives, and let's all apply this passage. Second thing, or third thing, third point, faithful in relationships. 
faithful in relationships. There are, in this passage from verse 9 all the way down to the end of the chapter, there are 16 people that Paul mentions. He's greeting them. He's saying, hey, this brother went over here to this church. This brother went over here. This brother went here. Hey, greet Prisca and Aquila. Greet them in the household of Onesiphorus. Greet these people. I mean, all 16 different people that Paul mentions from, as he's closing out this letter. And in this 16 people that we have, there are people who have been faithful to Paul, and then there are people who have been unfaithful, like Demas here. Demas, he says in verse 10, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas, we know from other portions of scripture, you can look up all of these people, they tell you where it all starts. Normally in Acts chapter 19 and 20, when Paul is at Ephesus, you'll read about Alexander, who we'll get into in just a moment. You'll see about Demas. You'll see about all these other brothers. They're coming in. Some of these guys we we see here from these relationships that he had is Paul's got relationships with everyone, just like you and I have relationships with each other. And we need to be faithful in our relationships with each other. You're going to have people in your life that may not be a part of this church, but you're going to have relationships with people and they're going to be good brothers like Timothy. They're going to be sons of the faith. They're going to be come alongside you, encourage you, strengthen you. And then you're going to have people in your life like a Demas who's going to leave, who's going to forsake you. They may say bad things about you. They may reject everything of who you are. They may be ticked off at you and maybe you did something or maybe you didn't do something. And you see that you got to be faithful in these relationships in each and every one. Look at the one I have highlighted in my book. It says, he says, get Mark and bring him with me for he is very useful for me in ministry. Let me just give you a little story about John Mark. Okay. John Mark, as you know, is the reason Paul and Barnabas splits up in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas split up. So in Acts chapter 10, Paul and Barnabas are there in Antioch. The Holy Spirit comes, says, separate from me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I've called them to do. They go on a missionary journey together. They fulfill their missionary journey on the way back, and they're getting ready to start a second one. Barnabas wants to take John Mark with him. And with them on the trip, Paul says, no, he's immature. No, I don't want him. No, he's not a faithful. He's young. He's whatever the argument on this is. It only gives us a little bit of it. But we know this, that it was big enough that Barnabas says, well, I'm taking him with me. And they split and go their separate ways. And so he takes John Mark with him. And then Paul goes and takes Timothy and others with him, and then they go on their second missionary journey, and each one doing their thing. Well, something obviously has happened who comes along, because John Mark ends up being a faithful young man. We don't read about, we don't read about Barnabas anymore after this, but we read about John Mark. John Mark also is with Peter. He's there in the, in the Jerusalem church. He's there with Peter. John Mark wrote the gospel of Mark from Peter's perspective. It's Peter's perspective in John Mark, but it's Mark. So this is him. So you can see the ebbs and flows of relationship. Sometimes there may be a little bit of rift. Sometimes, you know, you may not think you see somebody and you got a relationship, a good relationship with them, whatever the case may be, but then God may do something in you, may do something in them, and he may bring you together. But the goal is to be faithful. And this is what he says, get Mark and bring him with you for he is very useful for me in ministry. So you just never know how God is going to use people in your life. So be faithful in relationships. Even when you get hurt by someone, be forgiving, be loving, be kind. Because you just never know what God may do. You may look at somebody and think, oh, we could never be friends. And two years later or a year later, you may be best of friends and thinking we are total opposites. Well, total opposites get married all the time, right? I mean, Kay and I are like two peas in a pod, but the pod is very big. It's long. 
We're on opposite ends. That's why we have such great communication issues. <laughs> I said this, you said that. It's so funny. This is, I'm going to tell Kay. She probably, she's not in here. Is she good? I can get away with it. <laughs> oh, oh, she's in the back. Okay, I got to be careful. Whew. It, this is funny though. We're, we're laying in bed the other day and we're talking. And I said, hey, babe, you know, I just got back from Columbia. I said, hey, how about if we go to Ballyhoo together for a date? She went, Ballyhoo. And she goes, well, can I go to Bento's? I'm like, Bento's? Why would you want to go to Bento's? Ballyhoo, you love Ballyhoo. I love Ballyhoo. Ballyhoo's great. And so we're talking about it more. It threw me off. I'm like, what in the world? Well, she thought I said, I'm going to take you to Moe's. <laughs> Moe's? Why would I want to go to Moe's? Well, Bento's is next to Moe's. She doesn't like Moe's as much. So she wanted to go to Bento. And I'm like, I didn't say Moe's. I said Ballyhoo. You didn't say Ballyhoo. You said Moe's. I didn't. I'm like, Lord, when we get to heaven, I need this replayed. And those things happen, but we laughed about it. I'm just thinking, well, it threw me off that you said Bento's because I'm sitting there thinking, you love Ballyhoo. Why would you want to go to Bento's? Oh, well, because she thought I said, let's go to Moe's. So welcome to Moe's, everybody. Okay, no, no. But you just never know. Two opposites, relationships. Be faithful in the relationships that God gives you. Be a, be a source of encouragement and strengthening of this. And so you were very faithful. And then finally, last point. The reason we're to be faithful to God is because God is always faithful to us. Look at what Paul says in verse 17. And I love this. Here, Paul talks about, up. Oh, I jumped ahead. Let me go back because I forgot about Alexander. Every one of us have an Alexander in our life. It's the unbeliever. Alexander, Paul says, he did me great harm in Ephesus. You can read about what Alexander did in Acts chapter 19 or 20. I mean, Paul had cast a demon out of a girl. That was, the girl was his profit-making girl. He's making a lot of money off of her, selling idols and false idols of the goddess of Diana that's in Ephesus. And then he causes a riot. He called, and Paul gets thrown in jail, on and on and on and on. He did great harm to them. But I love what the Apostle Paul said. Look, he says, the Lord will repay him. The Lord will repay him. And it reminds me of Romans 12, 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Folks, we don't have to seek revenge on individuals. We don't have to try to avenge ourselves. The Lord will be faithful. The Lord will repay those individuals, just like Paul said. Paul could have done a lot of stuff and done a lot of damage to him, but he doesn't. But he knows that he, Alexander, did me great harm in the city of Ephesus. The Lord will repay him. And so we see that. And so that's just a reminder for us. Let us be forgiving let us, I'm not talking about just cowering and taking all sorts of abuse. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being faithful, that we're not seeking to avenge others. We want to stand. We want to stand firm. We want to hold to the truth. We want to preach the word. We want to do all these things. But in essence, this is what we want to do. The Lord will repay those who do great harm to us. That we can be assured of. And then the final point, as I said, let's be faithful to God because he's always faithful to us. In the midst of all this, look at verse 17 and 18 with the wall, what Paul says as he closes this section. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. Isn't that powerful? This is what the God's going to do for you as you are faithful. Are you are faithful in uh, ministry, as you're faithful in your relationships, as you are faithful in the word of God and sharing the word of God, the Lord, he's going to be there. He's going to stand by you. In other words, he's, he's coming alongside you to encourage you, to strengthen you, as it simply says. Strengthen here just simply means this. He's going to put power in you. 
It's what he's doing for Paul. May the Lord, but the Lord stood by me and put power in me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into the, his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That's what we can say too. You and I can say and pray this same prayer. Hey, the Lord stood by me. When I was weak, he was there to strengthen me and to put power in me. Why? So I could proclaim his message to all my friends, to my family. And I know this, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. That part we do know. God will give us the strength to make it. I know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. I am not worried. I'm not fearful. I don't walk in fear, full of faith, knowing this very thing. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and he will bring me safely into the heavenly kingdom, and he will do that for you. How do I know this? I know this because he sent his son Jesus for me, and he sent his son Jesus for you. And because he did that, he's given us the power we need to overcome all sorts of ungodliness, and to overcome everything this life has, throw, has throws at us. That's we can be assured of. So let's pray. Father, we thank you. God, help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful men and women of God. Help us to hold true to the word of God. Help us, Lord God, as we walk this daily life to bring glory to your name. So, Father, help us be faithful in preaching the word and sharing the word. Help us to be faithful in our relationships that we have. Help us to be faithful with the ministry that you've called us to do. And then, God, let us rest. Let us rest in you, knowing that you are going to stand by us and you're going to strengthen us. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's worship together.